We are honored to have award-winning filmmaker Matthew Heineman with us this evening. I first met Matt back in 2017 when his film, City of Ghosts, won GIF's prestigious Best Social Impact Film Award. We knew he was special when he donated the $10,000 prize money to the charity featured in the film. A year later, we were thrilled to have him back for his narrative feature debut, A Private War, starring Rosamund Pike. Earlier this year, we were excited to showcase his film, The Boy from Medellin, in our Social Impact Film Showcase. It won honorable mention. GIF strives to highlight filmmakers who drive positive social change, and Matt embodies that type of filmmaker. Um, I'll never forget speaking with him back in March of 2020. We were working on an interview event, and he was exhausted because each day he was putting on his uh, protective gear, going out into the middle of the pandemic, and making this film. And uh, it just documented one of the most important times of all of our lives. Um, so anyway, we are grateful to have yet another one of his incredible films at GIF. Um, and without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Matt Heineman and Wendy Stapleton, GIF chairman, who is going to be moderating a Q&A. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Matt. You have a busy, busy schedule, so you are one of our very favorite guests. And um, as uh, Ginger mentioned, I'm completely a doc nerd, and so there's there's no you know where you're one of my absolute favorite documentarians. So love um, love to hear that you're working on uh, what what you're working on, and and it spans so so much. So um, for this film, uh, how early into the pandemic did you know that you needed to make a film on the subject? First of all, thank you all for coming, and thanks for having me. Um, I think I woke up sort of in early March as the first cases um, were reported in the US, and just felt like this is a story that I had to tell. Um, I reached out to hospital systems all across the country and got basically rejected from every hospital in the country. And then the only hospital that actually said yes was, was um, Long Island Jewish in, in Queens. And so about two weeks later we started filming. So I, th I think the main impetus initially was to try to humanize this issue that at, at, at this point, at that point, had, was so relegated to you know, stats and headlines and frankly misinformation and in a sense sort of pay homage to the healthcare workers that, that we knew we were doing amazing work, but we didn't know what was actually happening, so. Yeah. Um, so at a time when family members were not allowed to access their family who were dying, how, how were you granted access? I think, <clears throat> so I, I made a film on healthcare about 10 years ago called Escape Fire, and one of the protagonists of that film introduced me to the head of, of, of this hospital, and I think they just felt that the public needed to see what was happening, and um, I think that's one of the greatest tragedies of COVID. Um, first of all, how politicized the issue has become, but also in those early early months, how we as a public were completely shielded from what was happening. And I, I humbly believe that if if you know America at large had seen how people were dying, what was actually happening inside hospitals, the, the public discourse probably would have changed a bit. Yeah. Um. One thing I think is awesome about you is I, I've, I've been doing some events with Brian Stevenson, and he talks a lot about being proximate, and that's basically what you've done your entire career, um, and that in order to other, understand people's struggles, you have to actually you know, be there and, and sit with them. Um, and you, you put yourself in countless life or death situations. Um, this is, was a little bit different. Were you afraid while you were filming this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my my dad battled cancer for most of my childhood and, and teenage years and through college, and I think I had this sort of phobia of, of going inside hospitals. And so 
despite having filmed in a you know, number of war zones and been a lot of sort of sketchy situations in my career, for some reason this was way scarier for me. Um, it was also, you know, when you're in Mexico or Syria or Afghanistan or wherever, you sort of, when you come back to New York where I live, you can somewhat turn off your brain um, and somewhat detach. You know, this was, we were living the same thing we were documenting. It was sort of a 24 seven full on experience for, for many, many months. We naively thought that this would last, you know, one or two weeks. And so we, were, we literally were filming like 16, 18 hours a day um, for the first couple of weeks. Um, obviously it lasted much longer than that. Yeah. So. How long did it actually take to shoot? How much footage did you have? I mean, we shot in earnest through the first wave, so mm -hmm. from March to June, um, but we continued to shoot for months. Um, the sort of goalpost of, of March to June, we didn't really figure out until the edit room. Um, but I think we had somewhere between 1,000 to 1,500 hours of footage. Um, what would you say is one of the scariest moments in your document documentary filmmaking career so far? You've had a lot. <laughs> um, I don't know. I hate talking about myself, but I, I don't know, lots of scary moments. But I think for this film, it was, um, despite how terrifying it was, despite how little we knew about how this disease mm -hmm. was transmitted, um, I think I can speak on behalf of my crew and myself. We all just felt this enormous responsibility to tell this story, and countless yeah. deaths we saw every single day. Um, you know, horribly sad interactions with families and through iPads and all this stuff. But I think the overwhelming feeling that we had every single night was the amazing love and beauty and humanity. Um, that we were able to witness. And so that's, I think, what drove us to continue to make the film day after day. Mm -hmm. So you, you answered this a little bit, but do, do all stories hit you the same, or there's something different about this being in your hometown? This is something you can't escape from. This is something you don't get on a plane and go back home and, and have a reprieve from. This was happening at home. Did that feel more all-consuming to you? Yeah, I think, I mean, it was nice to be able to finally make a film in my in the city that I've lived in for a long time. And um, when we started, we had no idea that New York would ultimately become the epicenter, especially in those early days. Um, and that the hospital that we filmed at would end up becoming one of the hardest hit hospitals in the country, if not the world. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, Ultimately, the film became sort of this portrait of New York over those, over those four months. It started out as this sort of homage to healthcare workers, but it became, you know, a portrait of, of what happened in New York over those four months. Mm -hmm. uh, hope is critical in all crises, and you beautifully demonstrate that here with the medical professionals, the need for wins. You obviously do not know the outcome of your plot lines until they unfold, so you could be in the same psychological situations as the, as the hospital workers and family members. How do you stay hopeful? I don't know, I guess I'm a sort of eternal optimist. Um, yeah, I, I just, and I was so, yeah, as I said before, I just was so inspired by the doctors and nurses and, and all the healthcare workers that we were filming. Um, yeah. It just was, it was such a privilege and it was such an honor to, to tell a story. You know, it became very clear very early on that this was probably the most important story of my life, probably the most important film I'll ever make. It's the film I'm most proud of. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just every single day I just felt this enormous weight to try to do it at, right. least, at least do it right. I don't know if I did or didn't, but we, we tried to. And um, yeah, and I yeah. think the patients as well. I mean, we saw so many deaths, um, but there were wins and, you know, Mr. Ellis was amazing and, and I think when you walk into sort of an ICU filled with COVID patients who are all in ventilators, you know, it's basically like a living morgue. But there's something about his eyes that had this sort of beauty and strength and, and determination that sort of set him apart. And so it wasn't an accident that we um, 
started filming it with him right away. Uh, we, for the most, most of the filming process thought he was gonna die, but there was just something really beautiful about his eyes. And so um, obviously he ended up making it, so. So that's what, I mean, there could have been main subject lines. Were there others that, that didn't make it, that you, you were following and then? There was no one that we invested as much time as with Mr. Ellis that, that ended up dying. There's plenty of people that we filmed that, that died, as I, some of which you see in the film. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Um, I loved your point about the juxtaposition of the people fighting so hard to save life in the pandemic and the casual cruelty of, the George, of George Floyd's death. Um, and those of so many others brought to the forefront in the Black Lives Matter movement. At what point did you know you needed to weave that moment in history into this film as well, and which you did so beautifully in, in the end? Yeah, I think it was, it was more of like a how as opposed to an if. Um, you don't need to be an epidemiologist or a scientist or a researcher to sort of just walk in the hospital and it was so clear, especially in New York, how this disease was disproportionately impacting people of color. And so obviously in those early days, we didn't know that George Floyd would, kill, would, would be killed and um, that it would spark a you know, nationwide, if not worldwide movement. Um, but as with most of my films, it's all about where our subjects take us. And, and through Dr. Duje, um, it just naturally became part of the film. And so we had to follow it. Yeah. I mean, I say this, it's, it's almost every film I make, but it's so true with this film too. When I was when I was 21, I heard a mentor tell me that if you end up with the story you started with, and we're listening along the way, and you, you've heard me say this, but um, good advice for life, good advice for filmmaking, and, and this it couldn't have been more true, is just be open to the story changing, and, and, and that's what happened absolutely with this film as well. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations. I, I, I love this film. Love, love all your films. And um, so happy you are, you did it. So I um, uh, want to open it up to the audience for questions. Do you want to repeat the, can, can everyone hear the question? Yeah. yeah okay. How, how as a filmmaker does he separate himself from the emotion? Well, I'm 38 years old now. I'm not sure I've cracked that nut um, <laughs> of, of separating. I'm, I'm not sure you need to separate necessarily. I think, um, yeah, maybe for my mental health, I, I should be better at that, but I, it, it impacts me every single day. Um, it still impacts me. And, you know, in the edit room, living it over and over and over again, hundreds if not thousands of times. Um, but I think that empathy and that care is what sort of drives me. And um, I don't know, I should probably lie on a couch and think about that more, but um, yeah. Hi, that's a beautiful film. Uh, I love the um, the sound and the, the the variation in volume. Like we're close up on Mr. Ellis's face and this, the jarring sound of the door opening. It's like we're experiencing it from his point of view, and the uh, the police uh, walkie-talkie and um, the uh, the music. I really really enjoyed um, the aerial shot of the cops from the bird's eye view. Um, I don't know how you did that. I'd love to know how you did that, actually, because uh, it looked like you came off the building. Um, and I was just wondering how how you, well, I guess that's my question, really. That's a beautiful film. Thank you. Uh, how I got the drone shots? Um, uh, illegally. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a short answer. Um, yeah, we got arrested a few times for flying drones but the office of, I don't know, drone, op drone operation in the New York City Police Department uh, knew us all by name. Um, they had bigger, they're big issues to deal with, so, yeah. Uh, 
I too enjoyed your film. It was just magnificent. Uh, you actually managed to dovetail themes so effectively with the healing of the doctor's healing and the way she approached the man at the Black Lives Matter parade when she said, your family loves you. And then you showed through the uh, COVID, um, when the patients came out of the hospital, how much their families loved them. I thought you brought um, these themes together so effectively. And um, you may not have seen that when you uh, began your film, but you certainly accomplished that. And I also commend you for your very final shot where um, the names were on the screen and you kept pulling back and pulling back. Um, that, uh, just to show the scope of this tragedy, uh, it was, that was also just marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, kind of like what he was saying about whether you can separate the emotion of it. I'm kind of like, I'm wondering the opposite. Like, are you invited to that baby's first birthday? And do you hang out with Carl, the PT guy at all? I mean, they were so, uh, like, because you've spent so much time with them. Do you then, you just move on? I mean, they just seem, you know, you were with that family, especially for such a long time. We're both families, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think. I feel so lucky to do what I do and to every like two years sort of dive into a new world. Um, I think this film probably more than any, I mean, I, most of my films are sort of walk the line between good and evil. Um, so I haven't necessarily been able to bring my subjects to screenings or hang out with them afterwards. I, I'm like extraordinarily close with every single person in this film. Um, we were just all together the other night. They've been coming to, to most screenings that we've had. Um, so yeah, I'm really close with all of them and stay in touch. I'm, I'm the godfather of Baby Leon. Um, so, um, <laughs> Anybody else? They had this like belief that the cameras helped save them, which I'm not a spiritual, or I'm, I'm a spiritual person, I'm not a religious person, but I'm not sure the cameras help save them, but I'm, I'm happy that, um, I think we did provide a sense of, of um, comfort to them uh, through that process, and uh, yeah. Wait, I, I have a question. <laughs> I'm just wondering, because I, I love to ask this question every time we have an event with Matt, what are you working on next? How can you top this? Um, I'm making a film about the end of the war in Afghanistan, uh, and I've, I was there this summer, um, filming the, yeah, the end of the war there, so, um, that's my next doc, and then I have a few, uh, narrative projects that I'm working on, too. Um, I have one more question. So how do you go from growing up in this town <laughs> to, you know, doing what you do and, um, you know, deciding to live a relatively unconventional life to understand, you know, people all over the world and at homes, you know, different struggles and who they are, like make that's your life's mission. How, how does that happen? It's awesome. <laughs> I probably should have asked my parents that question, not, not, not me. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I stumbled into this job. I guess um, I was a history major in college, and um, I don't know. I just, as I said, I feel really, really, really lucky to do what I do, um, and I just want to keep telling stories that that matter to me. And um, yeah, I mean, to the sort of quite the point about the. List of names. I mean, I get criticized a lot for sort of not giving context to my films and focusing very specifically. But I, I just so believe in the importance of highlighting individual stories to speak greater truths. And um, by focusing on Mr. Ellis and Brussels and Dr. Duje and Kelly, you know, I wanted to try to tell this obviously this larger story about about COVID and 
I think there's no question that that we've all been changed forever um, as individuals, as families, as the fabric of society has changed. Um, and so I hope in some small way that we were able to, to document all that. And, um, yeah, thank you guys for, for coming. And if, if you, uh, I mean, it's, these films are hard to get people to watch. And obviously, you know, it's a difficult film. So if, if you were at all moved, just please um, tell your friends. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.